So yeah, so um, so tonight we are on by Sanjeev Gordon, Ventures Director uh, at New Bolt Ventures. Uh, I'm Dan Pritchard, the co-founder of Tech South West, and um, I think quite a few of you are regulars, have been regulars on our, on our tech gathering series. So basically, yeah, we use the Hopin platform for our monthly tech gatherings, which are combinations of panel discussions and chat and, and audience in, in, engagement, what have you, and, and just um, getting those conversations going on different topics. Uh, we've been running that for you know, nearly a year now, which is fantastic. Um, and this is more kind of a specific focus kind of workshop that is, is fairly new to us, but as a sort of a format. But yeah, we, we sort of find an expert uh, on a topic that we know is of interest to, to some of our audience um, and let them do the talking, really. But what we do want uh, is questions. So I've got a few ready up my sleeve. Um, uh, but if you have thoughts, if you have questions, um, there's always a mix of different people in the audience, and you could be coming at this, I guess, from a you know, you could be you know, founder of a, of a tech company, you could be an investor. So there's different um, uh, you know, uh, questions you might want to ask. So, so we can put Sanj on the spot around those. Uh, and basically, we've got uh, three till three o'clock, um, and um, the idea is we'll hand over to Sanj to, to kind of talk through, sh sh share a few slides. Uh, and I'll, I'll butt in every now and again with some questions, but do please put questions in the chat as well. And then at the end of that, we'll have time for Q and A, that kind of thing, and, and um, uh, to put more questions in. We can pick up on certain threads that have, that have come out of the presentation. And then if there's time, there should be some time at the end. We could um, just dive into the networking area. And people who who are able to hang around for the full one hour, you just we just connect one to one. Talk to people, and the sound can be there, and I can be there, and and uh, we can talk to each other in terms of the the the, the, uh, the audience and what have you. So that's the kind of rough rough format. Um, only other things I was going to say is we've got our next tech gathering coming up towards the end of Mar last Thursday in March on immersive tech. So we've got. Um, we're looking at the Bristol scene, we're looking at Plymouth and the new immersive dome there, and, and a few other things in between. So do sign up to that. I think Joe will pop the link into the chat at some point around that. Um, and, and the other thing is we're running a survey at the moment um, um, around talent and what tech companies are doing around talent and how they're engaging with education and, and, and other aspects around that, because that's in direct response to the survey. We, um, well, the feedback we got basically from members uh, around some of the challenges around, you know, it's interesting, you know, there's the three big barriers in, in the annual survey, access to talent, access to finance, access to markets, you know, and conditions. So, so this, this workshop is bang on the, the, the topic around that, but there is a talent survey going on that we're just trying to understand uh, some more sort of detail around that. So, so yeah, so that's enough for me. So Sanj, I'll 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 shut up with, with um jumping with occasional questions and things. Um and if you and attempt to share your screen and uh, see if the tech all works. Uh, yep. and um yeah, we'll we'll take it from there. Great. Well, first of all, Dan, thanks to you and the team for inviting me on to this um and giving me the opportunity to kind of talk about the SEIS and EIS um policy both from an investee company perspective and also investor perspective. Uh, my team often joke about me being geekily obsessed with this policy. Um, I'll let you guys make the uh, judgment on that at the end of this call and see if that is the case or not. Um, as Dan, as you mentioned, we will try making this interactive. Now, unfortunately, I can't see any questions, Dan, so I'll wait for you to just butt in if there's any questions coming through. Yeah. Uh, just yeah, go ahead and kind of ask them as I'm going along so that it's uh, not as much of a monologue and uh, a bit more of a conversation where possible. Um, I won't let you, I won't make sure, I won't make you all read through this, but usual compliance stuff. Um, bro, so agenda for today, um, I will try keeping my presentation part um, to about 25, 30 minutes maximum, um, more time for the Q&A. And then, like Dan said, um, we'll hang around at the end um, for the networking, the one-to-one -one part of the networking, uh, to answer any other questions anyone has. So um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Newable, I'll do a quick kind of brief introduction into who Newable, who we are and what we're doing. I'll then go into a um, summary on SEIS, SEIS eligibility from a company perspective. So if you are looking to raise finance and you are looking to do it through these types of uh, mechanisms, what you need to be looking out for. And then I'm going to flip onto the other side and focus a bit more on the EIS, SEIS as an um, investor, the tax benefits, um, key considerations. I'll go through a couple of case studies and a portfolio approach, both from our fund side, overall portfolio approach with regards to your investment portfolio, and also as an angel as well. 
Um, kicking off with regards to Newable, um, as I mentioned, if you're not familiar with us, we were established in 1982 and we are limited by guarantee rather than limited by share. We're, and that's because we are currently owned by 32 boroughs of London and the City of London Corporation. When we were set up, we were set up um, by those boroughs because the government at that time was selling a lot of the property and land that was being used by SMEs and startups within London and Greater London into private hands. So the boroughs clubbed together and said, well, actually, this is servicing our SMEs. We want to be able to continue doing that. They formed this entity and transferred those assets from central government into this entity. Um, we now have over 350 employees across the UK, across four offices in the UK, and over £60 million in net assets. We still support over 20,000 SMEs and startups every single year. Um, sorry, just go back one. Um, we, for those of you who may have already heard, um, I'll go into a bit more detail. Uh, in partnership with Bristol Private Equity Club, we have recently been awarded a uh, £10 million fund from the British Business Investments now, this fund is to invest alongside Angels with us and BPEC, as well as investing alongside the Newable Fund itself. So it's really bolstering the amount of capital that we can be putting in um, to the early stage businesses. There is a focus on the Southwest um, with our partnership with Bristol Private Equity Club, um, which a lot of you will be familiar with. And there's also obviously um, the Newable EIS Fund match as well. In terms of Newable, um, around the wider services, we're more than just an investment house. Um, we've actually got three key areas in terms of the business. So key one of those is the advice. That's probably where we've got the most employees, uh, advisors. And the advice programs really are there to help startups and SMEs when they're looking at initially kind of strategy planning, bringing the product to market, research development, all the way through to exporting their product or service into different territories. Um, in addition to that, we have got um, space offering, which majority of it is flexible spaces across the UK. So we've got about 60 locations um, right from Aberdeen down to Southampton, where businesses can be taking desks on a monthly basis, um, a lot more kind of cost effective um, than your WeWorks of this world and a lot more functional um, for, for what we need to achieve with these small businesses. And finally, the money arm of the business is split into broking, which is a lot of our lending products, um, the private equity where we focus on management buyouts, and the bit that I'll be focusing on and the part that I head up is the um, venture capital, so funding for scale-up businesses. Uh, on that. So you've got three different areas there. It, I mean, is this one of the combination? Is it one of the other? Is there any, have you got an example of how you perhaps work in business, you know, across those different services? Yeah, absolutely. So that is, that, that's actually one of our key kind of USBs in the market. The fact that we've got all these different services and how we intertwine these services for business. So uh, one example, Hummingbird Technologies, they were a business that came to us in 2016, 17, um, through the advice part of the business, we then went on to uh, provide them with their um, kind of early stage capital. We then also helped them get grant funding and then have taken them on trade missions and worked with them on other trade missions to get them in exporting into international market. So there you've got an example of how we worked with the money and advice side very well. Um, we have got examples, City Pantry was one of them that took 50 desks in one of our office spaces and we're also a portfolio company from the investment side as well. So the, the great thing about this is when this was kind of all within under, under one house, if we're working with a business that requires something else, it's literally a phone call to my colleague to say, Kiara, we've got this business that's looking for this advice. Where can we put them in? How do we plug them in? Or vice versa, kind of if they've got a business that they've worked with, in some cases they've worked with for many years that then come ready for funding, we can then take them on um, as a project for the venture, venture side of the business. So that, that, there's a couple of examples of how we work together. And I guess it's really important. A lot of people come to us because we're not just a provider of capital and at a point which we are investing where they, the business needs additional support around them. 
we're able to provide that support. So yes, we bring the capital, but we also have the added value of the other services that we can bring to the table as well. I hope that answers your question there, Dan. Um, but yeah, moving on. So uh, the mission for us within the Ventures team is to really enable innovation to thrive with the support of smart money, deep domain knowledge, and an established ecosystem. Um, Should we break those down in, into the, does that, does that sort of, yeah. the, the last one in terms of, you know, the, the investment side, the, the expertise? Is, is that yeah, what exactly, that? exactly. I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, so the smart money aspect of it is we, 25 years ago, have uh, started the Angel Network. Since then, we have created a lot more of a um, independent investment committee and investment process that helps us screen, select and support the businesses. So we've got an independent investment committee of about six individuals who help us along that process and really bring a lot of kind of rigor and best practice from the investment market into our stage of the market as well. So that's the kind of smart money aspect of it. The deep domain knowledge is the angel networks. Like a lot of funds don't realize the importance of angel networks and, and the importance of the underlying angels. Even if you have an extensive investment committee, they won't necessarily have the deep domain knowledge of an angel within certain sectors. So we've got those kind of, uh, we've, we've got an angel network ourselves of about 350 plus, um, but then also work with, uh, with BPEC as well. Where we need to get particular sector expertise, we will bring angels in, help us with the due diligence, lead that deal, either sit in as an investment director, uh, investor director or a, uh, an NED or an observer, and then also help that business along its commercialization as well. With regards to the established ecosystem, it's exactly what I mentioned earlier on. It's making sure that we're doing more than just providing the capital and actually plugging them into other areas which can help them uh, on their commercial journey. So um, moving on to the key focus of what today is all about and why you invited me onto this, Dan. Um, so the UK venture capital policy was an extension of the business expansion scheme. EIS, Enterprise Investment Scheme, was the first one that came around in 1994. Um, and at that point, it was really ensuring that incentives, um, that private investors had incentives to start looking at investing in startups and early stage businesses. The UK at that point looked at the fact that they needed to get private capital into these companies to really get a startup ecosystem within the UK. They had looked obviously across to our cousins across the uh, uh, across the Atlantic and they basically said, actually, we need something in place to be able to compete. Now, um, it was probably one of the best policies that they've actually put in and it's been a cross-party policy uh, to date with both sides um, supporting this policy. Since then, they've introduced the Venture Capital Trust. They then went into the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, which was an even, ben even more beneficial for, from a tax perspective. And then more recently, they've added the social investment tax reliefs. We're probably gonna see a lot more with regards to the la uh, last one there. We're gonna see a lot more kind of um, conversations around this happening and this building up in terms of the types of businesses that will qualify for SITR. Are really these under threat, you know, government deficit and clawing back? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so in, in March last year, um, I was working with the UK BAA and Mark Brownridge um, from the EIS um, Association. We were lobbying the government to really make sure these incentives were protected, but potentially even increased. Now, it would be very difficult for the government to increase the incentives, but I think it's we could comfortably say that they're, they're going to be uh, ring fenced to a certain extent. Now, this is just my opinion based on the, uh, the, the, the conversations that I'm having. The consultation that's currently out there will probably look to keep what's currently there for EIS, potentially review the SEIS in terms of the limits. And I'll go into the detail of that shortly. Um, but I think this is one of the only policies in the UK market where tax incentives are seen as beneficial and we're getting money back for the HF, for uh, the Treasury. Now, what I mean by that is I'll give you an example for the EIS um, scheme. Every one million pound invested has provided or created four new jobs a year. That then obviously starts to create uh, tax receipts for the Treasury through income tax liabilities, 
you then get into a position where you've got corporation tax increasing because these companies are then going into profitability. So those tax reliefs that the Treasury is having to give investors is coming back to the investors and paying for those policies, whereas pensions and ISAs haven't quite worked out in the way that the the, uh, the government thought they would, hence why you are seeing a lot more um, of the tax reliefs being targeted on those sides, whereas I think the, head, the, the headlights are on with regards to the venture capital policy, especially because we want to really lead the way in terms of science and technology. Um, the Chancellor said that back in his budget previously and also reconfirmed it in uh, this budget in March as well. So I, I personally don't think there is any threat to the policy. There may be some tweaks with regards to um, allowances for companies, but I think it will be on a whole positive, really. So just covering off from a company's perspective with regards to the eligibility, first of first and foremost, if you are looking to raise fun, uh, funding and you're going down this route, I would start the conversation with a accountant early on. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is because you want to make sure things like your advanced assurances are in place. You have got enough um, assurances that your business qualifies. You're in a position where you meet the criteria um, and you don't fall outside of that where you would end up um, with your investors not getting the tax reliefs that they, uh, they think they're getting. Just a couple of key points here. On the SEIS side, it, your business has to be lower than, uh, younger than two years in terms of established time, asset value of less than 200 prior to the investment, lower than 25 employees, and the total amount you can raise through SEIS is £150,000. Now, if you are in a position, and we've got a couple of companies like this, where you are doing an SEIS and EIS together, you will have to close your SEIS before you can go on to your EIS investment. Um, and that's very important because it has a part to play in the end investors being able to get the additional tax relief from the SEIS rather than just all going into EIS. And on the EIS side... There's a question from Anthony, um, who runs Alec and South amongst uh, uh, sort of various tech-related things. Is that two years from trading or formation? Uh, two years for, uh, established. Right. So from actually formation, whereas on the EISC side of things, you can see there it's seven years from the commercial, uh, first commercial sale. So that's from the trading period. So you've got a lot more time on the EIS side of things than you have on the SEIS side of things. Um, in terms of the asset value, less than 15 million at point of raising, uh, post raise, it's 16 million cap. Um, employees, 250, and then fundraise is 12 million capped at 5 million per year. Now this changes slightly if you are a knowledge intensive, you can raise more than that. The limits on that is 20 million, uh, but you have to be a knowledge intensive qualifying company. Now for either of these two types of investments, the shares that are going into issue have to be new shares. So it cannot be um, secondaries. And also the companies cannot be listed on a recognized stock exchange. The only caveat to that is some AIM companies issuing new shares are eligible still for, S uh, for EIS. If you were to speak to your uh, tax accountant or, or your accountant, they'll be able to provide a lot more clarity on these points. It does get complicated when you are looking at AIM listed EIS. There's a lot more you have to take into consideration. Real, so uh, flip this round now into the, uh, the, the investor side and really looking at the incentives for investors that are coming into investing into uh, startups and early stage businesses with these tax reliefs. In 2016, there was a review done on the policy, and that was because a lot of the businesses raising funding through this weren't actually putting that capital at risk. It was what was known as asset-backed investments. And that was where an individual would invest into a company or a group of people would invest into a company that company had underlying property or assets. So if the worst was to happen to that company, those assets would be sold and money returned. Now, those kind of investments, thankfully, have actually been taken out. So that loophole has been removed um, under the patient capital review and no longer allowable under EIS, SEIS. And I think that's beneficial for this target audience today who's on the call because all of us have been championing the true spirit of EIS. 
which is investing in innovation, investing in tech, investing in businesses that are actually changing the way their sectors work or improving efficiencies, et cetera. So I think this has been a real move, in, a positive move in the right direction um, and has allowed us to really uh, back the right types of businesses. In terms of the tax reliefs, SEIS, as you saw earlier on, you're looking at businesses a lot earlier earlier in their stages of the life cycle. And for that reason, the government has basically given 50% tax relief. Um, with the capital gains liability, you can write off a capital gains tax liability that you may have had from the sale of any other asset. That's really important. So if an individual has sold a property or sold other shares and they have a tax liability of £20,000, as long as they are reinvesting that into, uh, reinvesting the gain into an SEIS, they no longer have a CGT liability on that other gain. Now, as you can see here, investors should all seek independent tax advice. I used to be an advisor. Uh, unfortunately, I gave up that hat a while ago, um, but I can kind of still go through the very brief uh, top line information on all of these. Growth on both of them are tax free. So any upside on SEIS, EIS is tax free. Now, when we're seeing some of the returns that we have seen within the, both of these two, that actually is a huge benefit um, for these types of investments. And there's a loss relief, which I'm going to go into in a lot more detail because it's a huge, again, another huge benefit to help minimize the downside of uh, these investments. Um, and finally, inheritance tax. After holding the investments for two year period, this asset sits outside of your estate, meaning if the worst was to happen to you as an investor, that passes to the next generation uh, tax free. So you're saving another 40% on the inheritance tax there as well. So I'll go through a few details on each one of those um, different incentives. Starting off with income tax relief, I've just got a very brief um, a summary as to what the numbers would look like. So if a partnership profits are £300,000 for an individual, and obviously in a partnership, it's uh, income tax liable. Individual taking that out would have an income tax liability of £120,000. If they were to invest in uh, SEIS and invest £100,000 of that three hundred pounds into an SEIS, they would be able to claim back £50,000 tax taking their if a net or their effective tax down to 70,000. That's a 23% effective tax rate on the total partnership profits. Next is the EIS, which is 30%. So you'd be getting 30,000 pounds back, taking your effective tax down to 90,000 uh, 90, pounds, which is an effective tax rate of roughly 30,000 pounds. So as you can see with the right type of planning, one, you're helping kind of manage your tax liabilities, but two, you're also getting a good investment out of it as well, where you'd be able to benefit from some potential capital growth as well as tax incentives and ta um, helping to manage your tax planning. There's a question that's coming, Sanj, about whether founders themselves can, you know, can, can, be, can, well, can they include themselves basically upfront investment? No, unfortunately, no, unfortunately not. So if and that's a really good question, actually, because I've had this quite a few times. So um, connected parties cannot obtain tax relief. So if it is a family member or a founder themselves, they can't get the tax reliefs because they are a connected party to the um, to the business. So it, 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 it's only tr what people are viewing as kind of true investments at arm's length um, transactions that can get the tax reliefs. I hope that answers that question. Brilliant. Okay, so moving on, loss relief. Really, really interesting uh, incentive here because it's, again, like I mentioned earlier on, it's another way of helping to mitigate the downside risk when looking at these investments. So not only um, have you had your initial tax relief, but if that business was to go to zero, um, you would then be able to claim additional tax reliefs. Now you can do that in two ways. You can offset that loss against any other gains that you've had from sales of other assets, or, and this is what's done a lot more, is you can offset that against your income tax uh, liability. Now, the way that calculation works is as you can see here, I've broken that down. You minus your initial tax relief that you have had, and then you multiply the remainder by your marginal tax rate. So if you are a 45% taxpayer, you would then 
in this case for SEIS, £50,000 times your 45%, meaning you would be able to offset another £22,500 as loss relief against your tax liability, meaning your total return, even though the actual investment has gone to zero, your total return is £72,500. So your actual loss is 27.5% uh, on SEIS and 38.5% on EIS. And that's huge. There's not very many other places that you can look to for these types of um, downside protections. Now, don't get me wrong. These are all there because these investments are high risk. You're investing in a business that's unlisted. You're investing at an early stage of that business life cycle. So the risks are obviously inherent. Even if you could do the best due diligence possible, there's so many vari variations or variables, sorry, that come to play. These are no doubt high risk investments. But with these types of tax incentives, it really helps you manage that, um, manage your, 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 your um, losses and risks. Capital gains deferral, so I mentioned earlier on, if you were investing in EIS and you had a capital gain from a property, so individual has made a chargeable gain of £100,000 from disposable of a residential property in year tax years 1920, that would mean the individual has a tax liability of £28,000. If that individual was to roll over that £100,000 into an EIS investment, they would defer the £28,000 until the exit of that EIS investment. Now, it doesn't write off that, uh, that, that gain or that liability like an SEIS does, but it defers it until a later period. And at that point, you've, you get, get your 30% tax relief initially on investment. You would then look to whether you defer again or you pay it at the year in which you have crystallised your EIS investment. Good thing about this point is that the I say good thing flippantly is the the capital gains liability dies on the investor's death. So if they were to have deferred a capital gain and that individual um, was to pass, then that liability is no longer a liability; it is written off. So some interesting planning can be done around this, and I, uh, as I mentioned previously. My old role as a wealth manager, we used to use these types of planning a lot when thinking of investors for succession planning as well. Um, finally, I'll go through a quick case study. So bringing all those points together, um, Sam has an income tax liability um, at a higher rate or sorry, additional rate taxpayer. So quite a substantial income tax liability. They've also had a gain from a previous uh, or sold assets that they've um, they've realised, and then they've also got an increasing inheritance tax liability. So, as a part of Sam's overall portfolio, we're really looking at how do we manage those tax liabilities from an income tax perspective, capital gains, and also thinking about the next generation as well. So, the case that I've used throughout this is for Sam to look at investing one hundred thousand pounds into an EIS proposition they would get their £30,000 uh, £30, um, back on investment. They would then get um, the, the deferral of that £28,000 that they had previously. And if the worst was to happen, as I mentioned previously, their, their total capital at uh, risk is £38,500. If they were to pass this over to the next generation after two years, they wouldn't uh, incur a 40% charge on the assets, so that's another £40,000 of saving there as well. So again, key point, this is in when done correctly um, and for suitable investors. And I say, and I stress suitable investors. Investors need to go into these types of opportunities knowing exactly what they are going into, the fact that their capital is at risk still, and that the investments that they place could go to zero um, if that business fails. Brilliant. So very simple slide, but there's a lot to this, uh, the image here and, and, and the actual uh, planning around this. So when I was in wealth management, I used to view a lot of my clients' portfolios from a barbell strategy. So for those of you who haven't come across this before, I would recommend, highly recommend you go and um, Google barbell investment strategy. You will see this in a lot more detail. Unfortunately, I haven't got that much time to go through all the different aspects of this. But 
in summary, the barbell approach is where you look at your entire portfolio on a spectrum of lower risk versus higher risk. In the middle, you would tend to have some um, income generating listed equities that might fall as part of the mid um, category. On the lower side of the risk, you're looking at downside protection. Now, at the moment, with the way interest rates are and inflation risks, et cetera, you've really got to search hard for what you could be putting into the lower risk end of the uh, portfolio to be able to get the returns that beat inflation and aren't kind of eroding away your overall portfolio. But the key point is you want to make sure you're doing that in a way that you're protecting uh, the downside from the higher risk aspect of your portfolio. Um, so this could be looking at potential commod- commodities or cash cash equivalent type um, funds. And again, income generating um, traded funds could also form, fall into this side. Then where we focus in terms of the higher risk capital growth, you want to be looking at, again, for suitable investors, diversification in this higher risk part of the portfolio as well. And what I mean by that is going across the entire spectrum. So you could be looking at um, emerging markets where you're looking at listed um, equities, AIM listed equities, so going slightly kind of small cap level, private equity, venture capital. You're starting to get diversification across different stages of a business cycle. And in addition to that, you then add in the geography and everything else, and you're managing that high risk part of your portfolio through diversification, which is one of the biggest and best tools to manage risk. So these are the kinds of things I used to think about quite a lot when I was planning for my clients. So how do I manage all these different risks while still making sure there is enough exposure to capital growth? As I mentioned earlier on, in the current climate that we are in and what we're going to be looking at over the next couple of years, getting some real capital growth is going to be very difficult in the market apart from looking at these types of investments at this end of the market. So where you are looking at kind of anything down from aim listed companies through to to early stage or seed level funding, that's where you're going to get some interesting real capital growth for an investment portfolio. So so stage of business key then is part of that in terms of that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So it is. So within all of those different parts that I mentioned there, they are what are classified as different stages. So you've got a business that is aim listed, you've got a business that's kind of private equity. And then within venture capital, you have businesses that are right at your seed stage where you're investing with a team or person and an idea right through to series A level funding where you're investing in a business that's got early stage traction, early stage revenue. So when you're, when as an investor, if you're thinking about your overall portfolio, Take a step back, and I'm just going to go into the next slide, which hopefully also answers this question. Take a step back, look at what, where is this business in in their journey? Are they at seed stage where actually I'm investing into an idea? Have they got a proven concept? Have they got uh, generated revenues to get them onto the commercial platform? And are they at a point of scaling and growing? So making sure you've got some cover, depending on your risk profile, some cover in all of those different uh, stages. And that brings me nicely onto how we look at portfolio planning from a fund perspective. Now, we break it down into uh, two axes. Bottom axis is the depth of technology. And then the side axis is the um, revenue. Now, the two green quadrants are where we focus in. What about, I'll cover off the base technology because this is still suitable for some angels. And actually, we find quite a lot of our angel networks still like to look at base technology. These are the kinds of things such as uh, consumer businesses, uh, platforms, applications, um, even to some extent where there's AI being used as an enabling technology. Those are covered in your base technology um, aspects. Now, another bit of homework for those of you who are interested, if you were to go and Google technology readiness scale, you will be able to see the full spectrum from deep tech to base tech or enabling tech. There are different points in that um, in that quadrant or in that spectrum, which we have basically assessed our um, framework against. 
So as I mentioned, the key two areas that we look at are deep tech, early stage, so pre-revenue or proof of concept type revenue. And what we mean by there is we will look at an a business that has um, a lot of IP, so it's protected itself from that side. It's got a bit of a moat around it in the uh, intellectual property that it has built, um, or they've been able to get a lot of defensibility by being a first market mover in some form or really disrupting that particular sector in a way that no one else has previously. But where you're getting into those types of businesses, you've got to be willing to go in at pre-revenue or proof of concept. And the reason I say that is because as angels and as an early stage fund, if we were looking at deep technology, which was generating revenue, the valuations are going to be a lot higher than what we would probably be willing to pay for because we still want to get some exposure or enough of an exposure to have a shareholding of sub substance within that company. As an angel, you'd probably be very similar, although you'd probably be willing to take a less a lower percentage, but you'd still want to make sure you're not investing in a company where the valuations are a lot higher than you could actually help support and follow on with. So that's why we focus there. And then on the other side where you've got um, a bit more of the, the mid-level technology, um, we can go in and we will go in to look for companies that are early stage revenue because there they've not got as much of a defensibility around them. They've not built as much of a moat around them to protect that business. So here, here you're really looking for traction to be able to justify your investment. And we pair the two together. So where we have looked at businesses that are kind of deep tech and pre-revenue will look to match that with a company that may be further along in terms of their commercial journey, but might not necessarily be as deep tech as um, it may be if it was pre-revenue. So that's how we look at it from our side as a fund. But this is very much applicable to an angel building their portfolio as well. So the fact that we have grown from an angel network over 25 years and now into a fund and a network together, we still align ourselves very closely with the, the priorities of an angel uh, network or a, an angel investor. Hence why we build partnerships like uh, BBEC, because it's a it's an angel network that gets what they're doing. It's a it's a part of the market where they are servicing good or finding sourcing good businesses that we can invest alongside. So where we are looking and the way we build our portfolio is in tangent with kind of a good angel network as well. Um, just a summary of a couple of the uh, or some of the examples of our portfolio companies within there. These will kind of go along that spectrum where you've got the, the deep tech uh, pre-revenue like you saw Echion. Um, Hummingbird Technologies, I mentioned as an example earlier on, uh, we've been working with them now for nearly three, four years um, since investment and also taking them onto trade missions and um, exporting into different territories. Um, a lot of the times these businesses that we've invested in, we've actually done more than just an investment, whether it be grant funding or um, advice programs that they've been on as well. Um, and finally, just key considerations when looking at the EIS or SEIS type investments. The reason I say investment structure there, as an angel, there's a couple of ways of investing, and then I'll go into the fund. You can go in directly into a business where you are listed on the cap table, you, are, uh, you get the shareholders agreement to sign on investment. The other way of doing the same type of exposure is investing via a nominee structure in which you would be investing through another company's nominee, which helps ensure that there is a professional entity that is dealing with all of the legal transaction paperwork, making sure that there is enough of a, a due diligence done from a legal standpoint to, to protect all of the investors and also make sure that the company's cap table is kept as simplified as possible, so that when that company goes to raise future funding, that the, a messy cap table isn't one of the reasons that they fall or don't get to the next stage, because that has happened and we've seen that personally happen as well. So those are the two ways of investing as an angel. So keep in mind what the investment structure is. Through a nominee, it's just like a pooled investment structure. Um, it's tra tax transparent structure and it still qualifies for EIS or SEIS. On the fund side, you've got two different types of fund settings. You've got a HMRC approved fund. In those funds, you get your tax relief in the year you place the investment into the fund. 
there aren't very many of these funds left in the market. They're a lot more uh, fixed in how they work and they don't provide the investors with as much flexibility with regards to tax. And the reason I mention that is because a non-approved fund like Newball's EIS uh, scale-up fund, you are able as an investor to claim the tax in the year the individual investment is made or roll back to the previous tax year. So you have the ability to roll over your investment over two tax years where required. So there's a bit more flexibility on being able to reclaim the tax. I mentioned quite heavily investment diversification. If you are an angel building your own portfolio, keep in mind the only way to really manage a portfolio in terms of risk is making sure you have got sufficient diversification across uh, several different businesses. It takes a lot of work and a lot of angels, some of you may be listening into this, will understand that you have to do a fair lot, a fair bit of due diligence on each one of those businesses. But make sure you're thinking about every year, how much exposure am I going to be giving myself into this particular asset class? Split that into how many different businesses you want to invest in and then go ahead on that where you then tweak up and down those percentages so that you don't end up in a position where come the end of the year, 80% of your portfolio is two companies and the rest of it is split across about five, six other companies. So you really want to make sure you're managing that diversification across stage, stage across sector um, as well. So there's key things that you need to be considering. And if you're investing in a fund, again, make sure you're getting sufficient diversification across number of companies and also the types of sectors that which you're investing in. Track record and history applies to both. Is In terms of the company, has that company founder or founding team got the credibility? What have they done prior to this, uh, to this um, business? How have they actually taken the business from where it started to where they are now? And what is their actual view and vision and strategy to get it to the next stage? Very similar to us as a fund. When people are assessing us as a fund manager for an EIS, they're looking at how many businesses have we invested in? What stage in, and, uh, did we invest in? How have we managed that business to be able to achieve successful exits for our investors? And finally, fees. In this end of the market, uh, there is a lot of talk, and I'm probably one of those who are championing this because of my kind of background in terms of the wealth manager side, making sure that we are transparent in fees. That is fees charged to the end investor, as well as fees charged to the company as well. At Newable, we use a blended approach of due, so we charge a mixed fees for the entrepreneurs and the investors for any money that we put in. These are all considerations to take into mind when going through any um, portfolio or building a portfolio of SEIS or EIS investments. I realize I have spoken for a long time there, so I'm going to... No, thanks. <laughs> really, really, um, really interesting. And a lot was covered in, in a whistle store, so... Um, no, thank you so much for take, taking that, taking us through that, both from, you know, from the, the company perspective and from the investor perspective. Um, we've got a quarter of an hour left, so do put questions in, in the chat. I've, I've got one initially. So, um, Go ahead. So one thing, so Tech Southwest, we, uh, you might know, we've launched the Startup Studio uh, mm -hmm. program, and, and and that has given us a snapshot. You know, we've, we've had a really good level of applications. We're oversubscribed, and. You know, it's interesting just because we had no idea what, what we would see, what we would get, I suppose, other than our gut feeling maybe and, and what we're reading about in the media, etc. So so in, a, in amongst that, you've got uh, quite a few health tech, you've got fintech, you've got AI, you've got platform builder, uh, you know, and a couple of advanced sort of engineering sort of types. Um, mm -hmm. This is one of the things that really interesting is, you know, trends, what you're seeing. And and whether that's national, but also that south the southwest flavour that we're all really interested in in terms of you know this sort of levelling back you know what what where are the starts coming from what are they focusing on um, you know what, what you're seeing in that arena. So uh, in terms of our portfolio, up until last year, <clears throat> because we kind of have been predominantly focused in London, a high percentage of our companies were London or Golden Triangle. Thankfully, with our partnership with BPEC, we are seeing a lot more inflow coming through naturally from uh, Southwest because of this partnership. Mm -hmm. More deals are coming into the top of the hopper, which means you're putting in more at the top. You're more likely to get 
investments coming out of the bottom end of that helper, which are going to be based in outside of London and uh, within the regions. So from our side, and I'm probably a bit biased because of our partnership, I'm we're seeing a lot of good quality businesses coming out of Bristol um, and coming out of the southwest at the moment. I think it's a really underserved market, hence why we put this uh, bid forward with BPEC is because the quality of uh, innovation that's coming from the southwest is actually definitely competing with that of London, uh, if not in some cases exceeding. Uh, but the level of capital just wasn't supporting it, which meant those businesses had to look outside of the region or even worse, outside of the country to get the funding that they required. So programmes like the uh, Regional Angel Programme is hopefully helping fill that gap massively within the whole levelling up um, agenda. Yeah, um, it's, no, that's good to hear. Well, uh, perfect timing, Jeff is also listening intently because does UK yes. investment impact the likelihood of investment? And are UK investors all keen to invest in local businesses with a London bias or Southwest? What, what about outside Bristol? So three questions there, one at a time. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think going through the impact of the, the, the pandemic first and foremost, mm. March last year till about June, we saw things just close off. Angels, everyone just pulled out and weren't looking and investing. Since about June, July last year, angels were the first to come back. And we are seeing more and more angels part with cash over calls like this. Mm -hmm. I could be based in Timbuktu and have a call with a, com uh, with a company based in Exeter. It doesn't really matter. Because actually, it might mean I have more phone calls with you. I may be doing more of these sessions with you before I place money. But now it's actually really taken down that barrier. Mm -hmm. I think hopefully, we will see more of that. From our own side of things with Newable, we have been requested to continue doing online pitching events because people then can assess a company before they travel anywhere for it. They can assess that company, meet them, and then make a judgment, actually, do I need to travel to Bristol or Exeter or Southwest, or do I need to travel into London or wherever it may be? So I think we will continue seeing more investments from outside of London. Uh, what was the other part of that question? Uh, uh, investors still keen to invest in local businesses with a London bias. Local business with a London bias. Is that a London-based business or is that like a Southwest business that is going national, that, is, that has got those London connections, might have people with on the board, I guess, or others that are, are sort of plugged into the London scene, maybe? Um, Should we have some clarity yeah. on that from you? <laughs> yeah. um, barriers, though, and, you know, online and, 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 and just, you know, opportunities like this. I mean, that's why we launched Startup Studio now, because actually now is the time to, to, to run something regionally when geography doesn't matter quite so much and when we can exactly. if, if uh, investors wherever they're based if, if, the brand is yeah. good, if the brand is strong and the track record and then you can s try these things and um, you know that would have been hard to do two years ago because we haven't had this great digital sh shove um, so the question we'll, we'll come, so, yeah, Jeff. so I've just seen Jeff so I'm going to go because that is actually an important part so um, Jeff we used to see a lot of businesses and even when prior to me joining Newable um, businesses that I worked with in the Midlands would their roadshow would be London so you would end up having all these businesses from all over even right from Scotland coming into London to present and pitch and do their roadshows and they would book in two three days where they'd basically just been seeing back-to-back -back investors um, thankfully that's actually I think going to not die no, totally, there'll still be an aspect of that, but we're going to see less and less of that because of the online aspect of being able to do these events. And we will hopefully start to see businesses travel to dip or money travel into the regions rather than the other way around as well. Well, we're seeing more investment funds coming to Tech Southwest and asking us. And, and a lot of them saying, you know, we understand Bristol, we understand the Bristol scene and the ways in and out, but tell us more about the, the across the Southwest. And, and now it is more general. Exactly. The, the There's a very specific question from Jason Scott. Our company has been dormant for just over two years and we are about to start trading or want to use SEIS. Should we open up under a new company to do this? That is an interesting point. So I've had case, uh, I've had a very interesting case on this one where they did, they were advised to set up a new business. Um, but I, I'd have to, it's very technical. You'd have to go and seek an accountant's advice onto that. Yeah. Uh, you may, depending on certain aspects of terms of, um, ownership and there was another thing 
could allow you to continue going under that same business. But most likely, you will probably need to set up a new trading entity. Cool, cool. So, so it is, it is a key question. So, when you're looking to invest, you know, and this question has been asked a million times uh, before. But what do you look for in that business? You know, in terms of you know the message to those southwest companies that are seeing you know, these opportunities. What, what are you looking for in that business? Yeah. So aside from that, uh, the quadrant that I showed earlier on, um, we there's three key things that we're looking at. One is the people. Now everyone says this, but we really want to make sure that they in the founders are. And I say founders because we very rarely invest in a single founder company. We want there to be uh, enough of a kind of dynamic between a founding or founding team to be able to invest in them. And we need them to have the drive, the hunger, the usual kind of stuff that comes with it but also people that are willing to work and take direction and support from other individuals. And that's really key because a founder of a business will be able to take that business to a certain stage, but they will require input and direction from investors or from advisors, et cetera. And if they're willing to do that, it makes that journey a lot easier for all parties involved. Mm. Um, Total addressable markets. So what is it that the, or the serviceable market? What is it that this business is trying to achieve? Can it achieve that market? Is it, a, is it something that is actually attainable and will change the way that sector is working? Um, and the actual, then the actual product or service itself is the final thing that we look at. Cool. Cool. Um, thanks, Dan. So, so Jerry's been, yeah, so, so they're looking at in circa one million it's three businesses in the next month so that's very encouraging. correct yeah that's uh, that's in that's one of the things that we're working with bpec on so we've got a couple of deals i think it's probably a little bit too early to start mentioning the names of those deals but a couple of deals that we are going to be closing um by the end of this month so um yeah do keep a look out you'll be seeing um some press releases going out from bpec and and, and us on this cool. And, um, and I think I'm going to come back to Jess follow-up question in a moment. But um, Anthony Story, who, as I said, runs Silicon uh, South, so has a uh, covers all the doors. So you know that is fantastic. And it's also, yeah, the doors of business angels are very active, especially like local companies. We've we've got these layers now, and these level in terms of you know local, regional, urban, you know, mm. more sophisticated thing than how we are joined up. And, and it feels like there's you know a couple more steps to to, to do that to, to bring the investors in. And, and make sure we're showcasing and doing it right, you know, in terms of the big events around pitching, but, but also the kind of the relationship building and all that. We're going to give it to people on a plate, I guess, in terms of catching the attention of uh, the investors because it's a competitive market. But it does, I don't know if you're seeing that, sound, but it does feel like we are now joined up and rather just, you know, it's just that place over there where we're on holiday. We are, we are a million miles away. Yeah, you know. yeah, exactly. And the thing is, I also think there's uh, there's a lot of, so positivity drives a lot more attention. So when you're starting to see more and more news about the types of innovation that's coming out of the Southwest, it's going to pique people's interest. And the more, the more we can, um, as a group for the Southwest, talk about the types of innovations coming out of there, talk about uh, thought leadership pieces for, from the Southwest yeah. or the rest of the country, not just focusing on the Southwest, but across the country. These are the kinds of things that are coming out of this area. These are the kinds of um, innovations and where we as a region can be leading, but also working with other regions to support the UK's strategy overall for being the, the lead global leader on science and technology, which I think actually a big part of that strategy can relate into some of the technology we've seen from the Southwest. The other thing I would add in is, coming back to your point there, making sure the infrastructure is there to support all those different parts. Because, and I think this is one of the things that has worked really well. I, I was told this when I went to um, and spent some time in Silicon Valley. Investors are meant to work together. We're not competing. And it's a huge, huge part. Like we need to have more collaboration across these different um, regional networks or regional funds and et cetera. We need to have more collaboration across the investors because we all want to achieve the same thing. And it's it's not a net zero game here where one benefits, one doesn't. Actually, there's a situation in which if we build the right infrastructure and ecosystem to be able to support these startups, we're going to see more of these startups coming out, yeah. which benefits all of us as investors. Yeah. So I think that's my only kind of real thought on making sure that the regions join up a lot more than what historically they might have done. Ooh. 
I'm not sure if you can hear me. I think I've lost you, Dan. Yeah, sorry, I just jumped off the screen here for some reason. Um, the answer was still good. I, kind of took, I flew back and, and how brilliant it was. <laughs> On the audience a little bit, I've regrouped back from the front row back back here. Um, no, no, I heard all that. And um, thank you. I think we've got a couple of minutes left. Just sort of trying to some, uh, it's, all the, the, the chat is coming thick and fast now, which is brilliant. And um, <laughs> just trying to s summarize s some of that. So I'm just going to point, Anthony, about where do you think the best places, the media channels, to put those thought leadership pieces and success stories, and where should that be? You know, we've, again, it's complicated because people look in different areas, but online, obviously, yeah. uh, and there's national media. But one thing, just a little plug, Southwest uh, Tech Daily, a new, pure, 100% focused on tech, uh, the sector itself, as a new website is launching in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and Tech Southwest are one of the backers around that. And we've got the former editor, the Sunday Times, ent the enterprise editor, Peter Evans, is going to edit that. Uh, and so, you know, the more again, that's all about being joined up and telling that story and showcasing. It. And um, so, you know, the, the more we can just keep to, keep doing in, in those kind of areas, uh, the better. Exactly. I think the more conversations the clusters can have with the hubs, with the investors. So we feel like we're all part of one community. You know, into the collaboration exactly. piece, and a, a lot of that geographically has focused on cities and areas pre-COVID uh, and post-COVID. It's now a bit more mixed, I think, which is which is brilliant. You know, in terms of you know, twenty percent increase in terms of tech Southwest membership and, and all of these things is it's, it's happening now because I mm -hmm. was to jump on these kind of calls and things. And um, there was a question yeah. from uh, Jeff. Uh, we've got two minutes left. I think we're just packing with questions. And at three o'clock, those who have to go have to go. We'll run over for a couple of minutes. We've run out of time for networking, um, but this platform stays live for about another ten minutes after. So if people want to to, to try that. Um, but I'll do the thank you thank yous now for those who have to have to have to drop off, and then we'll come back to Jeff's final question. Um, and then we'll probably have to wrap it up. So, so thank you. Uh, feedback, welcome. Um, you know, this is an area that tech offers are trying to build relationships and get people onto these sort of these monthly tech gatherings, speak to specific experts. So thank you, Sanj, um, New World for your your time today. It will be available on the Tech Southwest YouTube channel in, in the coming days. Uh, and, and you know, just drop us drop Tech Southwest notes about people um, that we should be talking to. And I know within the audience here, there'll be lots of experts on different things as well. So we, you know, we're always keeping the, keep the conversation going and, and that collaboration piece. But you know, wherever you sit in that ecosystem. So here's, here's the final question then for you, Sam. Before you can um, you can relax and um, uh, uh, give a give a wee bit of delight that the tech has all worked. <laughs> so, so Jeff uh, is saying. So, so lots of startups increasingly forming in, in these past you know few months virtually, i.e. their team is spread across the UK. You know, quality quality selection over locality, perhaps. How are investors seeing that nowadays? Does that make a difference? Is it, does it... That's a really interesting point because I'm going to link that back to one of them um, to your survey. Uh, number one point on your survey was um, concerns around lack of talent. And if now as a startup, so when you're when you're starting a business, naturally you haven't got as much capital as some of the bigger firms in terms of remuneration and whatever else. And a lot of the times that talent is sucked in by big cities like London, etc. So I actually think that could be a positive. However, I'm going to caveat that with a point that I think is extremely important as well. We've seen some of our businesses work purely remotely, and we've seen some who've taken a blended approach already. Um, the intangible benefits of face-to-face -face shouldn't be overlooked. There are times when that is needed. So as long as it's not total everyone in their own rooms, don't know each other kind of business scenario, I think there is an aspect of that being a, a benefit. Yeah, yeah, blended approach, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Well, I hope that answers your question, Jeff. Um, but sorry, and I'm just going to finish off by saying thank you to you for inviting me along to this. I, um, I think it's great to be able to talk about it. And uh, as, as you probably noticed, a very, a very interesting topic and something that I uh, could talk about for hours on end. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone does want to reach out, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. In terms of I've seen some businesses talking here about raising. Um, please do feel free to get in touch with us or with BPEC um, and we will be able to look at those businesses, whether they fit in and would be something that we can fund from our joint angel networks or um, through the, the BBI money that we've got as well. Yeah, so um, if people can't, if people you know, should be able to track people down, but if not, you know, we'll just give Tech Office a shout, shout and we'll point in the right direction. So thanks everyone. Um, you know, if you've been involved with Tech Southwest, the, the immersive tech one is coming up in a couple of weeks. And um, yeah, no, thanks so much, Sanj, and everyone have a good rest of the afternoon. Joe's just put your LinkedIn uh, profile there, so we'll, we'll keep the screen up for another 
another little while as people file out. And um, thanks, Ange. Have a, have a good rest of the day, and um, we'll speak. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Jeff, do you de definitely, Jeff, uh, reach out. It'd be interesting to carry on that conversation. That is absolutely my personal view, just based on our portfolio company. So I'm open to hearing more from others as well, because we're constantly learning and developing in this period of uncertainty, I guess. Yeah, yeah. On that note, we're going to have to have to pull up yes. your clothes. We have to. I know exactly. We could continue this. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things we're virtual. And if we're in a room now, we'd be, be doing that as we wander off to the to the bar or the coffee. Or, exactly. Or, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. We, alas, we can't do that, but not long now. Okay. Thanks, everyone. All the best. Cheers, all. All right.